Yeah, but I so. guess we should first ask the people. Um, okay, so I start the record. I make you a presenter and then. Mm -hmm. Where are you, Nicholas? Now you're a moderator. Yeah, okay. Then let me move everything around and start my. Oh, nice. No, um, I shut the wrong screen. I'm yeah. sorry. Oh. Uh, okay, it's that one. This is the. Yeah, no, no. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so. Hi everyone, I'm Niklas Merch. I'm studying computer science at the University of Göttingen in Germany. And I'm currently working on my master's thesis at the research group of Tim Meyer at the Institute of Pharmacology and Toxicology at the University, University Medical Center in Göttingen. So many words. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'm probably the youngest member in the Zila group that's speaking today. But let's see what I can offer. So my PowerPoint got stuck and I cannot switch. Okay, now it works, great. Um, I'm sorry for the technical stuff. Um, yeah, I will start with why do we want to use lab automation at all in our lab? I guess you all know the answer yet, but um, still just have a refresher. Then the experimental context, so what are we actually doing? Then our challenges of automation that um, I guess also apply for the other uh, labs presenting today. And then our approaches and progress. So what did we try to do? What did we do? Where are we now? What do we plan for the future? Then what have we learned so far? And then I will draw a small conclusion. Yeah, so um, in the pharmacology department, we do drug development and the drug development cycle is quite long, it takes lots of years to find a drug that can be approved and it starts with many, many compounds that have to be screened um, in a very uh, repetitive way. So you have lots of them and want to do the same experiment and just see if they have some effect that you uh, desire. And to do that uh, effectively, you have to increase the scale. For us, everything was manual a year ago and that's just not good. So we want to automate all the manual and repetitive tasks. Um, also, we want to reduce the risk of human error because if you scale up, but the error rate just stays the same, then it's not very good. Also, we want to improve the reproducibility because if there are many people involved doing manual work, then it's not very reproducible. And also not very traceable because if I write something by hand in my lab notebook, that just doesn't scale for uh, many compounds and many experiments. So we want to automate that as well. Then what are we actually doing? We are using engineered human heart muscle tissue, EHM, um, to establish an experimental drug screening platform. So what we have is human uh, tissue, human heart muscle tissue from um, uh, stem cells, induced uh, stem cells, of course. And we have rings of them. So here in the video, you see two poles in one of these wells in the plate. And um, it's heart muscle tissue, so it actually contracts like a beating heart. Much simpler, of course. <laughs> and so we have these 84 well plates. So on one of these plates, we have 84 of these wells, so 84 of these individual tissue samples. And uh, depending on the drugs we put in the medium, they um, hopefully change their behavior and that's what we're doing for the drug screening. So we test uh, different types of medium, different uh, drugs inside the medium and we want to quantify and measure the beating of these rings. We do that by mounting a camera on top of them and then doing pole detection. So we detect the two tips of these poles and then we get these pole distance curves uh, like you can see in the right. Um, it's just the distance in the detected pixels. Um, yeah, and sometimes if you found a drug or something that the heart cells just don't like, they skip a beat or um, the rhythm changes, and that's what we want to record. And this here is just a 10 second sample of one of these worlds. 
And of course, we have many plates. We have many worlds on one plate and we do the same thing every night and for more than 10 seconds. So it's lots of data that we want to collect. Um, but currently, the manual process looks like this, or actually in, in April when I started. So the rings in these worlds were all cast by hand. So somebody takes a pipette and actually um, pipettes these cells in a ring around these two poles and does that 48 times per plate. And then adds medium and puts uh, the plate in the storage incubator. You can see it on the bottom. So it's just a big uh, rack in, uh, behind a door and it's kept at cell culture conditions. So it's warm and humid and all that stuff. Um, but that's not enough. We want to measure them every day, every 24 hours. They have to be put in the measurement station on the right. Uh, top right, you can see another incubator which uh, just contains a camera, this blue thing on top. And you can place a plate down there. You close the door, press a button and then the recording starts. And after like five minutes, you open the door again, take the plate out, put it back into the incubator. And also because the cells are living, they need to uh, have a constant source of nutrients. So we have to change the medium every two days, which again means taking the plate out of the incubator, um, taking a pipette, removing the medium, replacing the medium for all the 48 worlds. Again, it's a very manual task, very, very time consuming and also very repetitive. So if something can automate it, it's probably this one. Um, yeah, and this, this process is repeated for multiple weeks, so four to eight weeks, and then uh, the cells usually um, start to die. And so it has re uh, to be repeated a lot. Our challenges in automating, first of all, we are a university lab, so of course we have a lack of funding. We cannot just uh, tell a company, okay, this is our process, please automate that for us, we pay you lots of money, that just doesn't work. And also we don't have a lot of IT and automation expertise because we are a toxicology and pharmacology lab and no IT department. So students like me, computer science students come in or postdocs like Tim, for example, also can do some programming but we are no experts in that field. So we have to do that by ourselves, but it should be as simple as possible. Then it also has to be very flexible because sometimes we have students that are just there for a practical course and they take, take a small project that takes four weeks and yeah, then the whole project has to change. The, um, the tasks are slightly different. And uh, so our processes, while automated, also have to be adapted uh, lots of times. And usability is important because if someone comes in and just works for us for a few weeks, we cannot train them in IT for three of these four weeks. It just doesn't work, so it has to be very easy to use. So our approach was, of course, start to do everything by ourselves. Or most of it, not everything, of course. Um, we don't build devices and uh, do incremental automation. So we start with a small subset of our process, automate that one, then take the next step and then try to connect those. And as a basis, we chose the Zilla standard for lab automation, just because we had to start somewhere and we heard good things about Zilla, so we tried it. So our first increment was to combine the storage and the measurement incubator, so the one with the plates and the one with the camera station into one automated incubator. Here on the right, you can see um, the inside view of one of our new incubators. It has two racks for these plates. On the right rack, you see 11 of those plates. On the left, you can see the camera again, this blue thing on top, and uh, this small circuit board in the middle. So a measurement now means taking one plate from one stack and putting it below this um, circuit board on the left stacker and then starting the measurement and then putting the plate back. So you don't have to open the incubator for that because there is a small robot arm that can take plates out and move them from one slot to the next. So this is fully automated now. Every night at 2 a.m. the robot just starts with the bottom plate, puts it below the camera, measures it, puts it back, takes the next plate and so on. And in the morning we have new data for all our cells. This was very useful for us. Um, but still, it's um, yeah. we also have to do the pipetting, the other two tasks, the casting and also the media change. 
And for that, we have a pipetting robot. It looks something like this. this. So you have a plate, put it below the robot. You still have to place the containers with the liquids next to it so it can take the liquids, of course. But then you just press a button and it starts its program. And when it's, when it's done, you can take the plate back, put it in, in the incubator, and at night it will be measured and everything's fine. So that's what we are currently working on. That's not finished yet. Um, but then the question arises, how does the plate get from the incubator to the pipetting robot and back? So the obvious answer might be, okay, just take a robot with an arm and uh, let, uh, let him do the job. But we don't have one yet, maybe next summer, but um, that's not certain for now. So we have to do it by hand for, just for now. Um, so we need a user interface because um, if the plates are inside this incubator, it's not so easy to get them out because there's this robot arm and doesn't, it doesn't really it likes to be disturbed. So um, yeah, what are our, our requirements for user interfaces then? Um, because it's in the lab, it needs to be usable with lab gloves and with as few interactions as possible. Because if you have to type lots of stuff uh, with, a, with a keyboard in the lab, then it's just not used by the scientists in our lab. Also, it has to be easy to learn because nobody can stay next to the incubator and tell every new student who arrives what to do. It should just be very easy to, um, to see what to do. So our solution was uh, using touch screens everywhere and using barcode scanners wherever possible to enter um, the plate numbers. Yeah, so at the incubator, this is now um, the other side of it. So inside you had these two stackers and the camera, which I showed you before. And now here's a tablet, uh, which has this program here on the left running on it. And in the bottom, there is a, a transfer station. And when you press a button in the uh, program on the left, the robot arm will just give you the plate that you requested. So um, the program itself has multiple columns, one for the plate ID, then the owner, currently PLUC, it's Pierre-Luc, one of uh, our um, PhD students who takes care of most of the cells. The location just tells you where the plate is. So for example, the plate in slot 12 is currently below the camera, at least when I took the screenshot. Currently, I don't think it is there. And plate 22 is currently outside. So um, you can use the deregister button to deregister the plate that's currently not inside. Then the slot will not be reserved anymore. And you can uh, use the store and eject buttons to store the plate or eject the plate if it's currently inside. And with the measure button, you start a manual measurement if you don't want to do it at night. But just now you can put a plate inside, press the measure button. Um, yeah, then it will measure at daylight as well. Yeah, for the pipetting robot, we don't have a sophisticated user interface so far. It's just a touch screen with two desktop icons. So you put your plate there, uh, prepare all the liquids, and then you just double tap the EHM casting or the media change program and it will run. We want to improve that in the future, but currently it's working, it's self-explanatory, so it's uh, quite easy to use, even though it's not very beautiful. So what have we learned so far? It's very important that the devices and the programs we use are interoper interoperable. So currently we have these two automation islands like the pipetting robot and the uh, incubator and everything uh, that moves plates in between uh, does not uh, really do anything with computers. It's just a human who, uh, who takes a plate and puts it to the next location. But if we want to connect that, then it's important that um, both devices kind of speak the same language. And it has to be decoupled because otherwise, if everything is dependent on each other, then um, software development just becomes very complex. Then, because of course, I said we want to do everything by ourselves, but in reality, we don't want to use every. Uh, we want, we don't want to do anything. We want that everything just works. So everything that a community can provide for us is very useful. So we can share ideas with the community. We can even share software with the community. So if someone has a device driver for our pipetting robot, for example, it would be great if we could just use it. 
And if we now implement a device driver for our incubator and someone else wants to have it, we can provide it. Um, yeah, then it's important to use open and interoperable standards because then again, you can have a community. If you develop everything on your own, you can't. And use tools familiar to scientists and students. Because as I said, we are no software developers. I might be considered a software developer, but um, most of the people who interact with the devices are not. And so we decided to use the Python programming language because it's the language that most people in academia know. Now, if someone knows how to program, it's probably Python or they could learn Python uh, quite quickly. So that's what we decided on. And why Zilla? In the beginning, we didn't really know. Of course, we heard lots of good things about it, but before you work with it, you just never know how good something is. And yeah, so now in hindsight, it was very good to start with Zilla because it's an open standard, meaning first of all, it doesn't cost us anything to use it. And because it's a standard at all, um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So Zilla just tells us how devices should communicate and I don't have to think about how to do the actual network programming, for example. Then it's vendor agnostic. So if we buy an incubator from one, from one uh, company, we are not locked in into their software because we, if we are using Zilla, we can just use any other Zilla supported device. Then Zilla really has a very welcoming community. It was very easy to get started. And if there were some questions, somebody could answer. And yeah, also you can see today, it's basically a community event. So yes, there is a community and it was very helpful for us. And I would invite you to join if you want. Then it also was easy to get started. Uh, Zilla has this plug and play concept where device drivers are just discovered on the network. So if you have a control software, you can basically ask it, tell me uh, about all the Zilla devices you can find. And for us, they would, uh, it would just tell us, yes, there's the, this incubator and it has these commands and it just works. And yes, it really does just work. Then it's also independent of programming languages. So while I said that for us, Python is important. Niklas, there's a strong, oh, yes, yes, sorry, I'm on my, on my last slide almost on my last slide. Yeah, um, so Zilla has a um, very welcoming Java and C-sharp community as well. And because Zilla is uh, independent of the programming language, we can learn from those people as well. And it has open source reference implementations, which was very useful to get started as well. Yes, so my very brief conclusion. If you want to start automation, but don't have the funding and don't have the expertise, you can do it. You don't have to do it alone. Just ask a community, for example, the Zilla community. And you don't have uh, to invest too much money up front. You can start incrementally and see if it works for you. And if you do so, you can also offer very great projects to interested students like me. So yes, if you are a university lab, please do that. It's very nice. Yes, thank you for your attention. Uh, do you have any questions? Niklas, thanks very much for this very informative talk, very clear talk. Um, if mm -hmm. there are any questions right now directly, we've got two or three minutes for this. Otherwise, you can also write questions to the chat during the talk if you want. I just open my chat. Okay. If not, um, then we yeah yeah Mark? maybe t Tim Tim uh, Niklas. So so um, what is the current acceptance in your group uh, with with your software? I mean, of course, the this graphical user interface is nice, but are there any more people that that can operate with the lower guts of your software? Or is it uh, uh, just you, both of you, that that can can operate on it? Um, currently, I'm doing the software development for the device drivers and also the control software. Um, but also, I'm still uh, shifting from our first attempts to now a, a better structured thing. And we just don't have any more students who are interested in even doing that. So yeah. I would like to help them if there are any. But um, currently, we have yeah. users who use it mm. and um, <laughs> me and Tim who write it. But mm. yeah. Yeah. But I hope this will change. But currently, we just don't have have any other interested students for that. 
Yeah. yeah, it's the same with us. It's exactly the same. <laughs> I mean, I have to say, for me as a supervisor, it's very complicated to get students and guarantee that mm -hmm. they've got some overlap so that one can from, learn from mm -hmm. the other. Because if Nicholas leaves mm -hmm. and then there's a one or two months break, it's going to mm -hmm. be a big problem to get the next one up and running. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there are questions in the chat. First of all, Lucas yeah. asks you. Uh, to make him the presenter so he can prepare his uh, slides. Yeah, I just did. <laughs> then then uh, where we asked, uh, could you please explain how you used Zilla to create the two automations you described? Uh, yes, so the devices we have, so the pipetting robot and also the plate handler inside the incubator, they offer a um, very basic automation interface. So for example, for the um, incubator and the plate handler, it's just a serial commands. So you plug in a cable and send some zeros and ones uh, to the device and it performs some tasks and then ask, answers with other ones and zeros. And so I implemented a Zilla device driver that translates these very basic commands into a Zilla interface. And also the uh, graphical user interface I showed, it's just the Zilla client. So it connects to the device driver and sends Zilla commands to this, uh, yeah, to the incubator out of the incubator device driver that I programmed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the, the interaction between the user interface and the device is purely Zilla based. Um, I hope this answers your question. If not, please uh, clarify what you meant. I think and we can then... talk about more about this at the end because there are probably going to be yeah. similar questions after the other talks. And yes. I would also... Uh, so yeah, and there's a second question about the specific incubate um, yeah. pipetter we have and if it was Zilla compatible. No, it was not. Um, it currently, I'm still writing the program um, for it. Um, yeah, so yeah. we had this before we started uh, using Zilla. Maybe we can talk about that later. Yeah, we can talk about so that. This is a very special, special, you've got a very special task with the ring shape pipetting. And this is a very whole different story. We can talk about this afterwards. But then again, thanks, Nicholas, for the for the nice talk. And now, Lucas, he already set up his presentation. So, Lucas, I just present you quickly. Many yeah, I hope everybody can. Yeah. yeah. So, can everybody see and hear me? We can see. I can see and hear you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can see your, okay. your screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Lucas, Lucas okay. holds a master in, in chemical engineering, and so he's also not a native programmer. And you're currently finishing your PhD in Munich, right? Or have you already finished? Uh, yeah, exactly. I'm currently finishing within the next half or year, like six or six months probably. Okay. That's the plan, but yeah, nothing goes according to plan. Yeah, and Lucas will talk about so, the yeah, well, thank you, Lucas. estimation. Yeah. All yours, Lucas, yeah. go for it. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Tim. And uh, thanks for the great presentation, Nicholas. Um, I'll try to stick to the 15 minutes allocated. Um, so I will not go into too much detail. So let's start. So the title of my presentation is Automated Bioprocess Optimization. Um, and Within this talk, I will be talking about um, what we do here in general at our chair, um, what our research is, and then I will present to you our, re our use case, um, the motivation why we want to automate, and um, then explain to you uh, what our use case looks like in detail. And after that, I will go into the automation software, what kind of approach we are taking to meet our needs. Um, and if there is still time, uh, there are some examples of that framework. Um, but if there's not, I will maybe move that to the discussion or send the slides out to interested parties. Um, all right. So let's start with the introduction. So I'm working on the project Digitization in Industrial Biotechnology. And our mission statement is to considerably decrease the time of bioprocess development cycles by means of miniaturization, parallelization, automation, and digitization. So there's lots of buzzwords, but um, when you boil it down, it, it's basically the same motivation um, as Nicholas stated. Um, there's, yeah, cycles of development, and they're way too long. They're usually like up to 10 years. Um, 
but we're more focusing on industrial biotechnology. So we're talking about large scale production of um, yeah, pharmaceutical products or products for the cosmetic uh, or food industry. So it could be anything from insulin to some food additive. Um, we are part of a larger um, project uh, group, um, which includes the research center Jülich, um, which does phenotyping of uh, microorganisms. So they try to modify organisms so that they produce a certain um, product uh, in a viable, well, um, yeah, on a viable scale. Uh, so they screen thousands of thousands of uh, mutants um, of microorganisms and then pass on the best um, microorganisms that they could find uh, to us. And we then try to figure out how to cultivate them in the best way possible to increase the space time yield. And once we're done with that, we have our fermentation broth, which includes all our microorganisms, the media components, but also the value product. And we then pass over our value product, the entire fermentation broth, to uh, the University of Hanover, uh, which is um, taking care of the downstream processing. So they purify our, the product. Um, and on all these stages, we try to automate the process um, as much as possible in order to decrease the development cycle. So each of these steps is one major part of the development cycle. And our mission is to decrease that cycle time by automation. OK. <clears throat> All right, so bioprocess development um, is very laborious and time consuming. So there's usually a large parameter space that you need to investigate. And yeah, so we try to decrease that. Um, furthermore, there's a lot of competition with um, the chemical um, industry. Um, usually those products that we produce can also be produced in a well, basic chemical um, way. But we try to use the biochemical way, which is usually uh, a little bit easier on the pocket because it's not as expensive, but the development time is considerably larger. Um, and yeah, in order to be actually competitive, we need to <clears throat> downscale. So we use fewer resources and we need to automate. Um, so these are two of the um, main approaches to reduce our development cost and time. Uh, in order to do so, we created the demonstrator lab here at TUM, which is the lab that I'm working in, um, which basically consists of our two hard pieces, a Duske parallel bioreactor system on the left and a Hamilton star liquid station, a liquid handling station on the right. And within that liquid handling station, there is a bioreactor, a 48 fold. So it includes 48 miniaturized bioreactors, which we'll come back to later. Um, our focus is very uh, much on uh, cooperation with industry. So the demonstrator lab is supposed to uh, showcase our approaches and our solutions and our processes to interested parties uh, um, from industry. So I already told you a little bit about our motivation, um, but here's a little more concrete example. So on the left side, you see a regular like, lab reactor, which we use. Uh, it's very, very large. It's approximately 50 liters. And with that reactor, you can run an experiment which takes seven days, approximately. It's usually around a week um, and uses a lot of resources. It's uh, very hard on um, energy and you use a lot of medium. And in the very end, you only get a single point of interest of your parameter space. Uh, so in order to optimize the process, you need many, many, many runs. Uh, which adds up to years um, if you don't have many of them operating in parallel. Then furthermore, there's a lot of manual labor uh, involved here. So you have to take samples um, and analyze them manually. So it's not great, but many companies still do that. And yeah, so our main motivation was to do it better. Uh, and for that, uh, our chair has been researching or developing uh, the Bioreactor 48, which is in the top middle uh, picture. Uh, it's a parallel bioreactor with little reactors, uh, which you can see on the top right. Uh, they're approximately 10 to 15 milliliters um, of reaction volume. And they have a magnetic um, stirrer, um, which also induces the air. You can see that in the middle 
bottom picture. Um, and with these 48 reactors, which are fully scalable to um, liter reactors, we can probe the or test the parameter space much more quickly. So we can actually do 48 points within a week instead of a single point in one week. Um, but in order to do so, we had to integrate this bioreactor into a pipetting station um, that takes care of all the other tasks that will come with uh, a regular fermentation procedure, such as pH control, uh, glucose addition, so feeding of the microorganisms, um, but also sampling and sample analysis. So we had to digitize and automate uh, forcibly. There was no way around it. Um, because you couldn't handle 48 small bioreactors uh, by yourself. Furthermore, the sample volume is much smaller as well, so pipetting is also an issue. Um, and on top of that, the reproducibility is much greater uh, as compared to like, weekly uh, batches that you do. Um, and the precision of a um, pipetting station is much, much greater than that of a human. So. Uh, our use case is basically a multi-stage fermentation. Uh, it, cons it consists of a larger scale um, bioreactor in which we produce lots of cells, which we want to test later on in the bioreactor 48. So there's a production in the Daskip system, the four times parallel system, which I showed you earlier. Then there's a transfer of these cells um, into the bioreactor. So first of all, it actually goes onto the deck of the bioreactor. You can see that here. So um, this is the Daskip system. This is our pump. These are containers in which the um, fermentation broth is pumped into. And then the liquid station um, actually uh, distributes that volume of all those um, reactors into all the smaller reactors. And once we're in the small reactors, we start our actual research. That's where we test our parameters. Um, but yeah, as you can see that all these uh, devices need to be connected somehow. So our goal was to create one workflow that you hit and then you forget. Uh, so this process takes a week and we don't want to interfere with it. So the first thing we had to do was, um, well, create uh, Zilla drivers for all of them. Um, there's plenty of devices here in this picture. There's all, um, also like a off-gas analytics under the table for the Daskip system. And there's also two thermostats under the bench, uh, which are used to temperate the bioreactor 48. Um, so yeah, that's basically our system and what we can do with it. Well, we can um, uh, run 48 bioreactors um, autonomously on a very small footprint. And there's only minimal manual work involved, uh, except for startup and shutdown. So we still need to do the um, um, well, the cleaning and uh, autoclaving. Um, yeah, and since it's all scalable, you don't have to do as many large scale reactor runs as well, because usually you do a scale up afterwards to check whether that your um, results from the milliliter scale are actually reproducible, but you can reduce that significantly. Um, and the entire setup can be used on many microorganisms from uh, Escherichia coli coli to Pseudomonas, uh, Pseudomonas putida, or even algae and um, fungi, uh, yeah. So what we managed here, uh, we reduced the development time because usually that process uh, to get 48 um, parameter points would take you about half a year, uh, at least with our, well, reactors that we have. Um, so some of my colleagues, they still use them and they, yeah, are fairly fed up that they have to use this old, uh, these old devices and we have all that new shiny stuff. Um, but yeah, um, then our automation software, what are our needs? So first of all, the first challenge we had was um, to actually create a software interface and we chose uh, Zilla 2 for that. Um, but we had to write many, many of these servers ourselves. Um, and as Nicola said, there's not many IT or automation specialists around here um, in the university context. So we had to develop them ourselves. And back then, three years ago, that was quite a hassle because the Zilla repositories weren't uh, in such a good shape as they are now. Um, 
And we also had to integrate lots of legacy devices that didn't even have an um, Ethernet hub or a, a USB port. Um, but what we did is we uh, used microcontrollers, Raspberry Pis, or Beagle Bones. There's also a um, journal article by our colleagues from Hanover. It's uh, shown on the bottom left. Um, and we use those to host our servers. We connect our devices to those um, gateway modules, as we call them. And then we hook up those gateway models to our network, and then we can discover them and use them from there. Um, but that's only the first step, integrating or like Zilla, yeah, to enable our devices. The next step is to control, to manage um, these devices. And then on top of that, you want to write workflows and execute them, um, workflows which in include multiple devices and yeah since our processes or workflows are not as time critical or not as long um, and we don't share any resources um, with other experiments um, we don't really need scheduling at the moment because we usually just run them and if it runs it runs there's no shared uh, resources but we also for the future for other experiments want to uh, look into scheduling workflows. Um, and then obviously there's uh, the automation of the data acquisition, processing and analysis, uh, which we still need to find um, viable solutions for. So. Whoa. Okay. Uh, all right. So, what is our approach? So, our approach is a service architecture. Uh, well, microservice service architecture. Uh, so, we basically create services for all of the issues um, that we're facing, which I will go into more uh, in detail later. Um, and then we uh, deploy these services within our network on a server. Um, and since they're all in our local network, we can also create like a discovery service, which then discovers all the Zilla servers, which are also part of our network. Um, we can deploy our databases in our network and then create services that acquire data, process data, and store the data in these databases. Um, and on top of that, uh, we can also create a uh, front end, uh, a web front end, through which we can uh, interface with our services. Uh, on top of that, all of that is open source, um, and we're working on that. There's also a predecessor, the Zilla 2 Manager, um, which this is um, well the next step of evolution of. Um, but what it yeah, actually looks like when we use it is there's a user, and he accesses our front end. It's a TypeScript um, app that uses Angular. Um, and this front end uh, is connected to our backend gateway which uh, is written in Python. It uses the fast API framework. And the front end and the back end then communicate with each other via HTTPS through, REST, through a REST API, um, and in some cases, WebSockets. And the back end gateway is our main service. Uh, it is just the gateway into our network. And from there, it redirects, it reroutes all incoming traffic from the front end that we need to display uh, certain information to the respective services. Uh, in our specific case, the actual service architecture is actually in another network within our local network, but that is getting into too much detail. But what it comes down to, we can deploy our stack, it's a Docker stack, uh, just with a single click of a mouse, and then it starts up, all the required services are up and running, and uh, we have our GUI, which is um, which incorporates certain uh, interfaces like uh, a browser for discovery uh, or a workflow editor, a workflow designer, a scheduler, and so on. And uh, yeah, so we use it in the front end and in the back end, the services talk to each other. So there's also like service A talking to service B uh, or service A talking to service C, but from the front end, I will never be able to actually directly access these services and I don't even know that they're there. Um, all right, furthermore, we can easily integrate with that architecture into existing um, 
infrastructure. So let's say we have a NIME server for data processing um, or analysis. We can easily integrate that into our um, framework because they also use REST APIs as most uh, services do. Um, so there's plenty of software that is free to use already out there that we can just use. Um, so yeah, that's one of the main advantages of that uh, architecture. And on top of that, it's easy if you have a student working on one of these projects because each service is kind of closed. It has its own responsibilities, its own API. Uh, so they don't have to know everything about the entire, uh, like all, about all features. They just have to know what is what does the service do that I'm working on. Um, and on top of that, we are independent of programming languages. So each server can be in a totally different language. We have some in Java, some in JavaScript, but most of them in Python. But since they all communicate via REST endpoints, um, it doesn't matter because that's basically the same language that they speak. Um, yeah, so the examples, I'm probably not gonna cover those because I'm yeah, hard on time. Um, so uh, I would like to, have a bit of discussion later at the very end. Um, and some of the talking points that I would like to contribute are um, what your opinion is about service-based automation software opposed to, as opposed to custom software solutions or monolithic um, solutions, standalone desktop applications, and what you take as on closed source versus open source in the domain of lab automation, and uh, whether you actually use Zilla in production and industry and in to what extent whether it's just like a trial out, like a tryout phase, or whether you actually use it in in proper production. And uh, well, if you uh, have the time uh, now, in the meantime, I would like to share a poll, which I will just post in the chat in a couple of minutes. Um, and yeah, that's it. I would like to thank my supervisor, Worcester Boots, and my colleague Nicholas Van Eichen, who's also working on this with me together. And obviously, our project sponsor, the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. So, thanks for your, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Lucas, for this very impressive talk. I mean, I knew parts of it, but I'm impressed every time again. I have a whole series of questions, but for the sake of time, I think I will will keep them for the end. Uh, for the online, for the poll, will you do you have a real time um, result of the poll? Uh, yeah, I was actually thinking about doing like a real-time interactive uh, questionnaire, yeah. but you can't really do that within a time frame of 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we could do that in the next uh, meeting. Um, yeah. We can would yeah. just motivate everybody to do it, and then maybe at the end of the or towards the end of the discussions, yeah. we can have a look at it and yeah. and look at the result yeah. and discuss them directly. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if everybody fills it out within the next, uh, before we start the discussion, obviously we can check the results. That would be, I think that would be quite interesting. Oh. Are there right, any I, I just posted it in the chat. Yeah. Are there any urgent questions to look at right now? Okay, then we can go on to Mark. Mark, I think you're an organizer anyway, but do I have to make you present as well? No. Sorry, do you hear me? Yeah. Is it working? Do you see my screen? Oh, you see? Okay, yeah, I see it. Okay. Is it? I mean, yeah, all, all set? Yeah, I mean, we we'll still have a short time for interaction. I mean, of course, your CV is a little longer than the other CVs, so I will just take just the major steps. <laughs> so, Mark, he's a chemist by training. And yeah, then. While well, he switched during his postdoc, he morphed kind of into biochemistry. I think that was in Denmark, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah right. Correct. And then he came back and went to the nice University of Greifswald, <laughs> currently working on the well-known Lara suite and on mm -hmm. yeah, high throughput protein screening. Yeah. And okay. yeah, Mark, all yours. Thanks a lot, Tim. And thanks also to Lucas and to Tim. It's it's very beautiful because um you introduced very well the problems and it's the same motivation we have, the same issues we have, and we come sometimes to the same solutions. And that's why there's also this nice collaboration between our three groups. And I, I like this a lot. I mean, I like really this community. 
Um, do you see uh, my presentation in full screen mode? Is it all fine? Tim? Looks good to me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay, good, good, good. So um, just for the, the ones that don't know our system, uh, I very briefly also make a short introduction into um, the, the tasks and, and challenges we have. So um, in Greifswald, we have this um, protein screening platform, a robotic screening platform. You see uh, like a from remote, all the devices we have in our screening lab. And in detail, I made a little um, video about it. Um, many saw it already. So I will quickly only go through the main points of it. You will see the full, find the full video here on this link here. Um, so what we do in our um, lab. And this is, uh, again, very similar to what Niklas explained. All these steps which I now explain are also done manually. So, so many people in our lab do it manually. And uh, they, for example, uh, yeah, uh, for colony picking, they use toothpicks. And uh, in the growth, they are done in Eppen they are doing it in Eppendorf tubes. So, so what is the difference now, and why do we need to to automatize the whole thing? So, so our challenges or our task here in, in our department is to screen for large uh, amounts of different enzyme variants. So, so we uh, basically have like uh, libraries of several thousands of different variants that, that we would like to screen for certain purposes. I'll come to that uh, later. It's just a lot. And how do you uh, cope with a lot? Yeah, you, for, you of course need to automatize the things. So the first step is to bring these um, uh, these different genes into cells. And this is something um, where we don't have automation right now. So we're planning to do that in the future, but this will take like a long time to, to really achieve fully, um, let's say automated um, library generation of different mutations in, in, a, in cells. So, so this is done manually, and then we uh, pipette our um, uh, library onto Petri dish, and this is also done still manually. Um, and uh, from there, automation starts. So we have these um, uh, uh, colonies in the Petri dish, then we have a machine and, and a robot that picks them, so it recognizes the colonies, puts them in micro, micro data plates, then we have them in 96 well or 384 well microtita plates. Then we grow them. Uh, we introduce, in, induce the protein expression so we, we can, by, by an external stimulants, uh, start the protein expression that it not <sighs> interferes with the growth of the cells. Then we can harvest the cells. We can op wash the cells and open them. So, so we basically, um, De destroy the wall of the cells and release by that the enzyme, so the proteins inside the cells. And then with this lysis buffer or lysate, we call it, we do an assay, an enzymatic assay where uh, a certain uh, optical property changes. So we change, for example, um, the, op uh, the absorption or we do a fluorescent measurement or a luminescent measurement. And then finally, we co collect this uh, data and analyze it and do statistics about it. And then we pick the ones that are very active, for example. So, and this looks in, in practice, so, so in, in real world like this. So this is the picking robot and it has these needles here where the bacteria are. Um, so it's, you, you see like um, the needles picking the colonies and then they're moving to this uh, Microchip plate filled with with um, media, and then we we in inoculate the media, and then we move this. And this is a manual step. Uh, move these plates, so 16 to 32 of these plates into the robotic platform. And this platform is, uh, and this is a little bit different to what you saw before, a, a platform where there is a really a central robotic arm moving everything. So we have here a 
four incubators. Three are used for incubation and one, this, this here behind is our refrigerator incubator. And then we have plate storage. Uh, we have two um, plate readers. So, so this doing this optical readouts. We have a liquid hand handling station, an Agilent Bravo, Bravo in this case, and a centrifuge and a dispenser in this platform. So and all these devices are right now uh, still controlled by um, software, monolithic software. So that's also something that uh, Lucas asked. So it's right now a monolithic software um, called uh, Momentum. It's provided by Thermo. Also the whole platform was initially designed by Thermo. So I did a lot of changes, of course, um, during the evolution. So we started with it 2012. And now it's a little bit different to what, how it looked from the very beginning, but um, the basic concept was already designed by Thermo. So, and then uh, you see here, for example, dispensing of liquids and let's skip. So then it moves, the arm moves it into the <clears throat> incubator. So here you can see how the incubator takes the plate and moves it in. So that was just a little bit real time. And uh, the, in our case, we use only bacteria. So it's not like in, in the case of, of Tim and, and Niklas, um, human cells, but we use only bacteria like E. coli. So similar to what Lucas is doing. And then um, from there, we harvest the cells. For that, we have this nice um, centrifuge with four positions for um, uh, micro tear plates so we can load with a robot we can load the centrifuge and then uh, spin it down and generate our pellets and then do lysis so for that we have this in assays with this liquid handling station as many of you uh, know so this is basically the process and of course uh, many of these steps are also done in, in, in the lab, but we want to automatize that, that we can really screen a lot of variants and a lot of different things. So and what uh, what is the objection of these screenings? So we would like to change substrate scopes for, of the enzymes, for example, or uh, so different uh, regio selectivity, stereo selectivities, also enhancement of the stability of the enzymes. And for that we use very different uh, directed evolution approaches. And the, the numbers are, it, it's under the range of 10,000. And this 10 billion is, uh, 1 billion is uh, if you, we, we couple it with microfluidics, so then we can uh, narrow, uh, we have first an, um, sorting by microfluidics and then uh, use the ones that are interesting in the platform. So, and so now what are the technical challenges to, to operate, operate such a platform in open source, of course? Um, so what we want is a full SILA communication of all devices. So very similar to the others. Um, um, and uh, on top of it, we would like, since we have these complex processes, so it's not like a, a simple workflow we, we are preparing, we need a a description language of the process that is, um, first of all, platform independent and flexible in the sense that we can uh, uh, use like uh, if conditions, loops, and uh, all the, the standard um, um, features of a, of a real programming language to describe really complex process. And the reason why we would like to have them process independent or platform independent uh, even is that we can move these uh, processes to a different lab and then in this lab the devices there available are used and mapped to and used then on this in this lab so that's why I, um, we are following this process independent uh, sorry platform independent language um, very important is the dynamic and error toler uh, tolerance scheduling. And luckily we have uh, uh, um, um, a PhD stu student, Stefan Mark, who's also in the audience, um, who um, is already quite deep into programming such a scheduler. And um, I hope in the future we can uh, show you much more of this 
uh, do also a demonstration. Right now, there's no time to do that. But um, so for small processes, it already runs. So that's very nice. Um, uh, for the machine learning people, it's very important that we have uh, full me metadata um, support. So all the, the uh, variables need to be, uh, oh, sorry, all the measurements should, should be supplemented with as much metadata as possible, especially if you want to exchange this data between uh, labs. We are in a, in a, in a very um, active um, project called Kiwi Biolab with the Technical University of Berlin. And we would like to do machine learning and, and, and bio pro process engineering with our experience. And, and so, so we need to transfer data from our lab to the, the Berlin lab and vice versa. And for that, we need a universal uh, semantically annotated uh, data format. Um, um, based on, on, on a common ontology to really enable an, an automated transfer of, of information from one lab to the other. So, and, um, so the ultimate goal of this, um, of this development is to uh, make autonomous experiments, so dis autonomous, autonomous design, execution, or even evaluation. And in the ultimate goal, even a, a coupling and a, a closed loop design where you start with an, a certain setting and then the, the uh, AI machine learning suggests new parameters, new conditions to improve, to find better variants. That, that's the ultimate goal, um, or at least new improved conditions for, for um, protein production in the first stage. That, that is the goal of the Kiwi Biolab, for example. And the ultimate goal for me, because I'm a long-term sci long scientist here in Greifswald, so I can have really wide visions, is to really couple this and also do the genetic modifications and optimization of the enzymes then in the end. But this will take some time. Um, so if, as you can understand, you need a lot of control and, and uh, modules. And we also did the same decision as uh, the two others, so like Niklas and Lukas going for Python, because this is the language all the academic academics learn first, or it's the most popular language uh, uh, in, in academia. And it, I think right now in, in programming world at all. And um, we are um, programming different open source modules. Everything what we do is um, also available online uh, on GitLab. Um, uh, and uh, if you don't find something, please contact me. Um, I will point you to all these locations. Um, so what do we, just to have a look on the time. Well, time is running. So what we build is um, already, uh, we we also uh, or already implemented um, Xila servers for our robotic arm, for the four incubators, for the plate reader, it's a thermal barrier scan centrifuge and uh, Stefan is working right now on the barcode reader for the liquid handling station right now we don't have the um, CELA support because um, Agilent didn't react on my request from several times but I'm still um, optimistic to get some information from them because I now know someone personally that that's always good but if you for example have an idea to get hold of Agilent API, please let me know. So then uh, very briefly, what, um, how does now this um, general description language look like? So it's a, it's a simplified Python. And I think that even if you don't know Python, you can easily understand what's happening here. So we have here a move step of a container from a source location to a target location. We have an incubation step um, of, a, of this container with this dura duration. It's a variable, so 120 seconds in this case. 
at the temperature 300 Kelvin. And then you have a move from, from a source location to a reader, so to the reader location. Then you have a single read uh, command to read something with a wavelength of 600 and 660 nanometer at a temperature of 305 Kelvin. And then you move this container to a, a, a target location in the hotel. So that's basically it. And, and, and this is how we envision to write simple processes and uh, even much more complexes. And the, the workflow is looks like this. So we have this language that is then translated into um, 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 or mapped in, to the devices you have in your platform, in your lab. And then uh, it's submitted to um, our Python lab orchestrator that contains a scheduler and a data aggregator. And this scheduler that calculates now based on, on this workflow, the schedule talks to the, then the orchestrator talks to the different devices like liquid handler, incubator, uh, via SILA commands and aggregates the data from them. And this data is then stored into this LARA database um, through SILA animal protobuf um, communication or GRPC. So um, these are the three ways to, to access and the LARA database and the LARA suite, which I will very briefly mention now, uh, is responsible for storage, evaluation and visualization. Okay, uh, just to mention that if you have like different uh, formats in, in scientific formats, uh, you we have like a framework for reading different data files and converting to them into a standard um, pandas data frame format and also to animal. Um, then, uh, as I mentioned, we're developing this very holistic LARA suite, which is a very complex piece of software that uh, is, initi is, is really uh, targeting to, pro to do the project planning, process design, process execution, data collection, evaluation. Um, and uh, we are not alone. We are doing that together with, uh, for example, the Kiwi Biolab, um, so with the people from Theo Berlin. I already explained this a little bit, uh, and uh, Hildesheim, we do a lot of machine learning then with this uh, data that we derive. And we have uh, another strong collaboration with the uh, NFDI for CUT, which is the National Research Data Infrastructure for Catalysis, where we try to specify uh, data formats or standardize data formats for catalytical data that we can exchange data in a standardized form. Okay. and. Um, so my summary is very similar to what the others did. So, so I hope I could convince you that this is really um, um, uh, required that, that we need an open source infrastructure uh, and a community that, that, that builds that and, and uh, have this uh, exchange of, of know-how and, and, and source code to to um, achieve our scientific goals easily. Um, and by that, I would like to thank all our partners, especially, of course, Stefan Mark, who's also in the audience doing a lot of this programming together with me, and um, the projects partner in Berlin and in Darmstadt and Lille, my, uh, our group leader, Uwe, and of course, all the here, the, the CLR community, the Kiwi people, the animal teams, and our money providers. By that, thanks a lot. Yeah, great. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for the very nice talk and for staying in time. You're welcome. Um, I really like your expression to be a long-term scientist. So maybe I should <laughs> start calling myself the same. <laughs> so, I think we can now go directly into the general questions. Is there anything directly specific for Mark's talk right now, or should we go to the general questions? There are quite some questions in the chat, and luckily, Lucas already started answering them. <laughs> I would like to separate it so from the from the questions. There are some which are more technical, 
which Lucas took care of now. And there are some which go more into the conceptual part. I think we should start with the conceptual ones and leave the technical stuff for the end. Just for example, yeah. which I was asking to, well, this time to Niklas and, and Lucas, but I think this would also be good to hear an answer from Mark. Well, how much would it take to, do, 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 do? yeah, how, well, how many people will I need to run the systems? And here I think it's nice because since we've got this, well, the, since the order of the, of the presenters, Nicholas as a master student working for less than a year on the project. Then we had um, Lucas, Lucas, who's been working for, a, I don't know, two, three years maybe on the project. And then Mark working even longer and how the projects get bigger, get more complex. And also how the code base gets increasingly large. And also, as we all know, gets increasingly difficult to maintain and, and to overview at the end. And so, for, um, yeah, let's start with Mark. How many people will I need to run your system? To run the automation I mean, system? The automation system, I would say two people to, I mean, one for the bio, filling the machines and then setting everything up and one for the programming. That's enough, basically. Yeah. Maybe and, one more for, for planning, doing the, the molecular biology stuff. Yeah. So two to three people, that's that's fine, I would okay. say. Can anyone besides you work the machine at the moment? Or how long would it take to train a person to operate it? Uh, yeah, I mean, the momentum stuff, it's only me who, who can uh, operate it. Uh, the the uh, Sila stuff, Stefan and myself can operate it, or it's it's even just Steph, Stefan. I mean, part of it is only Stefan, right? Because he's right now uh, in, in this development phase but in the long term it's just the two of us uh, and uh, we are of course planning to do some some uh, nice interfaces together with uh, Lucas as well and uh, maybe Nick Niklas will also join to make it something like a graphical block block based uh, yeah. stuff for the for the bio people yeah maybe we can get the same question to to Lucas Lucas yeah how many people do yeah. you need um, depends on what you're looking at, uh, whether you look at using or and maintaining, or whether you look at whether you want to keep on developing. So right now, one person would be able to use it. Uh, that's basically what it also was for the past two years. So I developed most of the software, and my colleague he ran the experience, uh, the experiments, and he used it in the lab. But um, obviously, if we keep working on our project. Um, we will always need at least one person to maintain the code and mm -hmm. keep developing and one person who, who actually uses it. Um, so at the moment I have one uh, working student who is just dedicated to uh, writing tests for Zilla devices, for Zilla servers. Mm -hmm. And right now, since there's a new Zilla implementation, he will also start updating the oldest Zilla um, servers because there's some servers which I haven't touched in two years. They run, they work but they're not feature complete and they're not good. So that's just one person, 20 hours a week. And then there's me, I had to write an entire scheduler for our LHS, which I, mm -hmm. uh, um, I was writing about in the chat. And um, yeah, currently there's two other students, or well, no, actually three students developing the service-based architecture with me. So it depends. There's one person necessary to run it, but there's a whole lot more people uh, necessary to actually develop it. But you are the mastermind behind the whole software, right? The whole software complex. So you Yeah, I kind of try to, to organize it and then I have different students working on different services. Um, so there's uh, Robert who's actually sitting right next to me. Uh, <laughs> he is working on a workflow um, designer based on Node-RED. So it's a graphical mm -hmm. user interface. Um, then I'm currently porting um, the scripting environment in Python, so we can use that as a service as well. So there's two ways to actually write your um, your workflows. And then there's another uh, student of mine, uh, IT student, who's currently investigating uh, NIME. Um, so we just got a license for that, an academic one, so we can run a NIME server somewhere in our network, and then we can uh, deploy our data flows, our data processing steps on there. 
um, and trigger them from our actual workflow so that whenever we need some kind of like larger processing power or some nice output or some animal port or whatever, mm -hmm. we can use that. So there's, yeah. But Lucas, you're not a trained, you're not a trained programmer, right? Or have you no. any formal yeah. training? No, I just did uh, chemical engineering and I did some theoretical programming in Python. Uh, like, like um, basically, uh, oh, networks, metabolic networks. Um, mm -hmm. I did that in my master thesis, which was basically just Python, but modeling, um, but no software engineering. I just yeah learned about that in the past two, three years the hard way. Yeah, and Nicholas, what about you? Uh, yeah, so uh, the first question was how much time will it take to set up the system and our system is an incubator where we um, scoot, uh, we scoot around with it a lot, we um, modified it, we modified the hardware, so um, also we included this camera station which is probably something that you would not uh, want, so if you just want to have an incubator, currently our software does not decouple that, so our software has this measurement camera thing uh, tightly coupled with the plate handling thing, which um, also it's based on a legacy library that's not supported anymore. So I'm currently in the process of uh, rewriting the driver for our incubator. But when I'm done with it, I will um, provide it as open source software. So if you have the incubator, you can just download the software and run it. And then you have a Zilla driver for that incubator running. So basically you would just need a serial to USB cable to connect the incubator with the um, a PC. Like you plug the USB cable in and then you start the program and tell it on which USB port uh, the incubator is connected and then it should be running. Uh, so how much money will it take? Yeah, well, you would need the incubator, but um, running my software does not cost money once it's open source. Currently you cannot have it, so it also doesn't cost money, but you also cannot run it. Um, but yeah, everything that I write uh, during this process is either too bad to publish it or will be published as open source software. Um, yeah, then how much uh, people you need to maintain it or to run it. Currently, it's just running. Uh, you have seen this uh, machine with a tablet mounted on top of it running this interface and there has have been like three or four weeks where I didn't hear anything from the people who operate it. So maintenance is very low once it is running, but of course the development uh, took some time and you would probably face uh, different pro uh, problems. So um, I guess maintenance costs and also the time it takes just decreases over time. If it's running, then it will just run smoothly. Um, but until then um, you will need more people. Um, yeah, but as I said, currently there is sadly nothing that you can just use because it's too tightly coupled with our uh, overall setup. And for the pipetting thing, um, it's kind of running, but um, it also needs a lot of work uh, to be in a state where I'm satisf satisfied with it and then I will also publish that. But mm -hmm. I'm not even sure because it's um, it's based on a proprietary library provided by the manufacturer. So I'm not sure if I'm allowed to publish that one. Maybe Tim can tell you more about it because um, I'm I'm just the student who programs and <laughs> uh, buys, buys all the stuff and tells me what I can and can't do. But um, yeah, so from my side, if you want to have my software, I can provide it to you, but currently I don't think it's useful to anyone. But yeah. There was another question in the chat, which was on the technical part about the API for the Agilent machines. So we also had to do some reverse engineering because uh, not all the all the ports are clearly de defined in the documentation usually. And then again, it's very helpful if you don't speak to the salesperson, but if you get contact with the technical people in the companies, which sometimes give you some hints, which are semi-official, let's say. Yeah, sorry, the first two parts of the question, I didn't pass them to Mark and Lucas because I was afraid the answer would take too long. So, yeah, for Mark, to set up your system, I think this is a, I mean, your system developed over time, I guess. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, uh, so the question is how long does it take to set, set up? <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so right now I'm planning to de make a, a Kubernetes deployment of my Lara suite. Um, that means that uh, if it's, 
if it's one stun, it's just a, a basically like like Lucas said, uh, a click of the mouse, and uh, you need to edit one config file with all your passwords. Uh, that is the ultimate goal. Uh, I hope to have that done in in two weeks or so. That's my at least the, the initial uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, setup, and then uh, we are planning to do some some continuous deployment, continuous yeah. integration, and, and work continuously, iteratively. Yeah. Yeah. And I you mean, can download it from GitLab. GitLab. I mean, there's one one thing which jumped into my eye or ears again which is very typical for academic projects, that these projects, like for in your case, Mark, and also Lucas, they really depend entirely on you. So if Mark, if you leave today or Lucas, you leave, I guess your systems will be mostly very hard to keep running, right? Lucas, do you want to say something? If you would go on, mater on paternal leave now, today? <laughs> uh, um... That's a very good question. Luckily, <laughs> I have over a over. working student <laughs> who I convinced to start uh, a PhD here at our institute. So he would probably take over, and I believe that uh, everything would be in good hands with him. Yeah. I mean, this is, of course, a big difference between academia and, and company, because in a company, they couldn't allow to have the whole company depend on one person. This would be a bankruptcy mm. for the company. Mm. So. <laughs> Okay, um, Lucas, are, are there any other questions right now? Otherwise, I would say we have a look at the survey results, right? And there um, was a question by Wolfie McNeil, um, yeah. basically yes. about how this is scalable or not. And um, yeah, maybe you ask the question, Tim. Yeah, so Rory asked, um, well, there are two questions. There's one, how did we use Dila to create the two automations? Or in this case, now the three automations. And the other one from Rory, it's, where is it? Oh, yeah, there are many questions. Oh, there's a large oh. question, yeah. Yeah. That's the one I'm... What was the last question? <laughs> it's a very long one. So my question is, do you think there's a path to making automated processing using Zilla scalable so that the solutions are out of the box, more or less? and hence can be taken up by tens of thousands of labs rather than just a handful of pioneers. Yeah, that's a question I also ask myself all the time. So who wants to answer? Niklas, you're optimistic, um, you are the youngest. Yes. I'm also optimistic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, first of all, there are manufacturers that now just offer um, Zilla drivers for their devices. For example, the incubators that uh, we use and also uh, Mark uses these uh, cytomats from Thermo Fisher. The new iterations of them just come uh, with native Zilla drivers. So they um, are sold and then you have the device and also can uh, communi communicate to them with Zilla. We have uh, old iterations of them that cannot do that for now. So the application that I am um, currently writing and planning to um, publish as open source software would be a device driver that you should hopefully be able to just install on a device, uh, plug the um, incubator via USB cable into this machine where the software is running, and then you should have a Zilla driver um, running on that machine that uh, directly communicates with the incubator. So basically as a proxy uh, to having a native Zilla device, having a device that uh, sits in between both. And of course, as long as just one computer science student in Göttingen is the maintainer of this program, then I don't think that thousands of people would install them and uh, would install it in their labs. But yeah. Um, yeah, that's sadly how it is, I guess because open source software is probably not being picked up by many device manufacturers, but um, even if the software is not open source, if you just buy a device and it uh, runs with Zilla, then I think that's quite nice. And then you again have the opportunity to use many uh, Zilla control softwares. So for example, uh, of Unite Labs, or again, use a Python library that we are using or do anything with them just, yeah. Currently, while Zilla is not uh, um, very adopted by many manufacturers, then yeah, I guess yeah. it just takes time and we cannot do much about that. Yeah. 
Lucas, you, you want to ask them not they um, change the schedule? Yeah, I would mostly agree, but I think I'm a little bit more optimistic. I mean, yes, one of the main problems is that a lot of hardware devices are not natively Zilla yet, um, but I can just hope that that is changing. Um, speaking about software um, as like an open source platform, I mean, there are successful um, models for that. I, mean, I mentioned NIME earlier. The software itself based all, it kind of is open source. You can just download and use it. But as, long, but as soon as you want to actually use it commercially, uh, you require like more of it. Uh, and then you have to pay NIME. So that's how they make money. So there is software as a service, um, open source um, ways of actually making money off open source um, software. Um, there's also InfluxDB. It's a time series, da uh, time series database. It's also open source. But as soon as you want to start integrating it and use it on like a company, on a commercial level, um, you do need their support. Um, so I believe that something like that would be possible um, within the Zilla ecosystem. Uh, it just isn't there yet. Yeah. Um, because one of the main problems is that all those closed source systems, you don't really know what's out there. Um, that's also why I added some of those questions in the questionnaire. You don't really know who uses what. Most people don't like to talk about it or don't talk a lot about it. Um, and you never know whether they just don't want to tell you or whether they <laughs> don't know themselves or whether they haven't found anything that suits their needs yet. Um, but I believe there is space for like, yeah. an open source software and there would be a possibility to, ma to maintain that openly with a community uh, supporting it. Yeah, we've got a few minutes left. I just want to like to go to the next part of Rory's question because this I would like to answer myself. So if so, what would be the main steps on that journey? So here, I mean, there's a rough idea, which is not new, which is like call uh, the Open Zilla initiative, that we have a dedicated code base. And I mean, what is crucial for, for these GitLabs is of course to have a, a full-time dedicated uh, maintainer, which makes sure that the quality of the code is very high, very high standard, that they are, if possible, feature complete, that you've got professional, like systematic testing of all the code. And then this can, of course, not be provided by, by master students or PhD students who want to write their code, get the functionality, and get their title and go home in the best case. So, and I already, I mean, we, we mentioned it to Daniel, and I think this would be a very crucial point to get a dedicated maintainer for the software repositories. And that in the ideal case, you've got a plug and play. So this software gets uploaded, gets automatically tested, gets compiled, you download it, and it really works out of the box. This would be, the I have a dream speech. And I don't know if somebody has wants to add something to this idea. But yeah. Um, so okay. what technical Fun. development do we need? I think we've got everything we need for this. So it just has to be done. And yeah, how long might it take? Yeah, I mean, you need the right people and then it could be, I think it could be done within maybe, I don't know, a year, 18 months. Lucas, Mark. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this yeah. is open it's discussion, so this is not limited to yeah. the speakers. Anybody can answer. Yeah. Patrick, or, yeah, Mark, go for it. Uh, I just want to say, yeah, so if you have um, some people that, I mean, right now, Nick, Niklas is doing this amazing uh, new implementation of Python, which makes it much easier to, to write um, um, new um, implement uh, new um, driver servers. Um, of course, we had this this code generator, which is also already in, uh, quite an improvement. So you can just uh, specify your features, and then uh, most of the code is generated uh, in the old repository. And something like this uh, will come, I guess, uh, also with the new implementations at some stage. So um, uh, if you know someone who's at least have an idea of how um, to write Python and go a little bit and make some tutorials about C. Like he will become very fast and, and professional, and then can write within months uh, servers and and infrastructure. And we're building it that it makes it easy to adopt. So yeah, so so it's it's a year or so I would say. Mm -hmm. Lucas, do you want to share the result from the poll with us? Yes, yes, I can. It always takes a while to switch on the yeah. microphone. I'm now using the web app. Um, could you 
allow me to share my screen? Oh, yeah, I disallowed you. <laughs> Um, have received anything yet? Should no, I okay, think yeah, okay, one second. All right, um, yeah, so the well, let's zoom out a little, okay. So, the first question, right, let me refresh, maybe somebody else uh, answered in the meantime. Um, okay, yeah. So the first question was, do you already use Zilla at your company? And uh, the answer was, well, 57% yes, we already use it. 0% um, no, we don't use it. 40% I don't know. And uh, approximately 30% that they're planning to. Um, then what is your high level lab automation software architecture? 57% Microsoft or service-based, and 43% a mix of both. But no monolithic or single standalone applications. Uh, which lab automation software solutions are you using or planning to use? Uh, and then they had a few. The ones that were mentioned were Kamunda, software by BSSN, Research Space, yeah. Lab Twin, None twice, uh, others three times. I can go into that. And another others, and another others. Maybe they added yeah. some. Uh, I, yeah, I can actually look at those. Uh, you actually, look at in this question. I was wondering because for, for me, R Space and M Lab Twin, they are not really lab automation programs. You know, it's rather. Um, yeah, they go. Yeah, but they they go into the direction. It's the same with um, Lab Folder. They sell it off as um, well lab folder then they rebrand themselves to lab forward and now they also have lab operator which is definitely that kind of um, software the same goes for one limbs um it, it is actually it's the one by osterwalder uh it is kind of like just a lab notebook but he's going on and developing into the direction to become uh, a full like lab automation software so they're allowing integrations so i just mentioned a few names uh, i didn't Necessary. I mean, they all have different strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Um, then the next question, how likely is your company to adopt open source or software as a service lab automation software? Um, well, 42%, yes, uh, very likely. 28%, um, hmm, rather skeptical. Um, wait, I'm sure there's a better, yeah, like this. Yeah, so zero is very likely and 12 is unlikely. That's interesting. Okay, so it's, most people are very critical and skeptical about open source software when it comes to actual use at their companies. Um, and the next question was, what are the main lab automation problems you're facing? Uh, this is a long one. Let's see what the results are. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, it would have been nicer so, when you, you know in your questionnaire if there would have been a separation mm -hmm. between academic and and company answers. Because yeah, I was expecting more to have more company people in the. Um, in I the mean, call, from, but from the list we have mostly company people. Yeah, but, so yeah. that's what I was expecting, and that was what this questionnaire was aimed at. Uh, so many people said lack of devices with standard interfaces. That's what we were talking about. You have to uh, implement your own um, devices, your legacy devices. Uh, there's no native embedded Zilla devices yet. Then, well, another problem is digitizing those devices um, and writing the standard interfaces. Then a lack of available software solutions. So apparently some people um, don't know about the solutions yet or they don't fit their needs. Um, Lack of um, open APIs that, well, I actually <laughs> talked about that um, in the Zilla working group earlier. Um, you have the universal Zilla client, but the API is not publicly available in, a, in an easy fashion. Um, so I think that goes into that direction. Um, 
yeah, too many individual applications. There's like specialized software for very specific parts, but you can't really connect them. Um, low quality of the used software. So some people are also uh, unsatisfied with what they have. And yeah, this goes into the same direction. Some of them are not very user friendly. Lack of funds, uh, licenses or service fees, lack of support from upper management, change management, lack of skilled labor, uh, workflow design, workflow scheduling, data acquisition, and data standardization. So these seem to be the key pains, um, although we do have a very small sample group here. <laughs> yeah, but it's impressive. Um, Apparently, I was, I was the only one who was complaining about lack of funds, or there were very few complaining about lack of funds. Right. Yeah. I would have thought this would be a bigger, bigger issue. Yeah, so it yeah. seems like by far the biggest issue is that there is no devices that are natively Zilla. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, the next one is, uh, please tell us about yourself. I don't think we can go into that. <laughs> it's a little private. <laughs> and anything else you'd like to share? Maybe somebody answered something here. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's Vishal. <laughs> I took the time to answer that, actually. Yeah. OK. Well, thank you very much for answering the questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have a closer look uh, later. Um, I'm not sure how comfortable people feel about sharing this, but I would have thought that the default is I won't share, <laughs> or I wouldn't share without permission, <laughs> to rephrase that. So um, I don't know, is anybody here that would object to sharing these? results with, I don't know, Tim, uh, Niklas, and Mark? No problem. That's fine. No problem. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Okay. I think we should discuss uh, Michael's question about um, deployment not really, or um, updates not really being about code, but more about software deployment, since Lucas and I uh, seem to disagree on that as well. Maybe we can just have an open discussion about that. Yeah. Yeah, I just turned on my camera. So um, maybe one thing to add to this deployment issue, um, at least for us, we don't have the computers in the laboratory connected directly to the internet or the, um, the Forschungszentrum uh, network infrastructure. Um, so when it comes to deployment, installing Python environments on a computer that doesn't have an internet connection is always painful. Mm -hmm. um, also Python environments are huge. So um, actually what, what I prefer there is, um, C sharp and .NET, because with those technologies, there come also deployment mechanisms um, that can work across this barrier of having a like almost air gapped um, installation. Um, yeah, so maybe just something um, to think about. Um, feel free to ping me if you uh, want to have a separate call and discussion about deployment strategies. Yeah, I actually totally agree. Currently, um, some of our device drivers run on C Sharp and deployment is quite easy. Um, but with Python, yeah, as you mentioned, installing Python is not always easy, especially not um, if you have custom libraries and want to interface with different devices or if you're in a regulated environment, you really just don't want to install lots of uh, random Python packages there or are not allowed to do that even. So then, um, something more uh, airtight is always better. But then I would argue that um, some solutions written by a random master student in Göttingen is not really what you're looking for. Um, and also, um, yeah, who's responsible if something breaks? So if I um, deploy an update to our um, incubator and our production doesn't work for a week, that's okay, um, that's, um, yeah, they can blame me and it's fine. Tim is not happy about that, but nobody is losing too much money. But if if you deploy an update written by me into your production environment where you, where you actually rely on uh, having it working, and then you have to create an issue on GitLab and hope that I might fix it in a few weeks, that's just nothing that you can do. It's just not possible. Very related to this is also the question of logging and monitoring. Um, because, I mean, we are all aware of how different logging solutions can look um, depending on 
is this a TCAN system or a Hamilton uh, system or a driver that was written by a master student. Um, in many cases, the logs don't show up or are not stored anywhere. In other cases, they are like in different places on the hard drive. Um, there are also good solutions for sending logs to a central um, server or database. Um, but then this also requires integration with the different um, applications. Um, and that's, I think, also important why it's uh, good to have um, open source applications where one can like, contribute back and have a good deployment strategy because, um, yeah, it depends on, I mean, I cannot interface the, um, the TCAN logging with any of the other logging solutions and it's a pain in the ass to have logs scattered around 10 different places or not even mm. having them when there's a problem. Mm. I mean, we are planning to make like a logging feature in a central, um, in a central way that, that the, um, Scylla, uh, the Scylla Python um, has a logging in build basically that, that that's um, that might already help uh, i'm aware what? of this logging feature where you're logging like what is happening on the zilla side mm -hmm. um there has been some work on this like two years ago already if i remember correctly um but uh, i'm not talking so much about logging what is happening with the device but there for lots of devices there's um internal um state management to the device driver uh, because the, in addition to responding to the Zilla commands and Zilla's communication, the application still has to monitor what is the state of the centrifuge, what is the state of the robot, without even communicating that to the Zilla side. And then there's a, when there is a problem, maybe the, the robot software just crashed, then um, also these crashes and eventually also just a crash of the, uh, a fatal critical crash of the application needs to be locked somewhere. Um, so we cannot rely on a central server ac accumulating these uh, logs from the Zilla um, interface because this yeah, might what, also go down at the same time. But what stops you from writing a Zilla feature that gathers the logs of the application and then mm. offers them as a observable command or observable mm. property? I mean, yeah. the, the application does write the logs somewhere. So with Hamilton, we know where the logs are. Uh, so if you really need those logs, you could just create a command, an observable, that continues reading out those log files, and then you can just subscribe to them and store them wherever you want. Mm -hmm. And in case of a crash, you can just uh, subscribe to the event stream and you can uh, act upon it. Mm -hmm. But then we are back at um, self-made solutions. So nothing that people can just deploy because if people have different needs, then nobody will have an open source solution for that. I mean, you could consider, you could, I mean, if you create the feature uh, and you just need to supply, let's say, the path to that specific file, I mean, that's the least you, you would have to do. Uh, it is kind of out of the box because you have the feature, you just tell it where to look for the, for, the, for the log files and then it runs. Or upon deployment, you enter wherever that log file is and the server knows automatically. Okay. Yeah, but hmm. sorry. To drop, I think we are getting very technical and it's getting very late. <laughs> so there were some questions from from that Dolores Arenas, right? In the chat. Are you still around? I just wonder if there are some questions have been answered in the chat already. Are your questions answered or? Because it's not, or are there any other? Because I lost track of all the questions in the chat. Are there any open, <laughs> open questions which we should answer right now? Otherwise, I would just ask. I mean, everything has been recorded. I will stop the recording now, and this will probably be reformatted and provided by Carmen in some way. <laughs>